I'm back. Good evening, everyone. First thing I'd like to do tonight is to introduce our district governor from District 7610, who is hosting us tonight, to give us a few words of welcome from the Bailey's Crossroad Rotary Club, Pat Borowski. Please come up. Debbie and Geetha, yeah, come on up. Debbie, if you want to introduce yourself. Where's Geetha? Okay, come on, Geetha. Got her up. Okay. So good evening. I'm Debbie Wall, current district governor for District 7600. Hello everybody, I'm Geeta J. Ram from District 7620. And I'm Hugh Dawkins from District 7630, where the entire state of Delaware and the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And I'm Pat Borowski, District Governor from 7610, and I'm here to welcome you both to our district and your very first formal Rotary leadership development program. So has everybody had a great time? Yeah. Okay. A few years ago, we were sitting in the same seats as you all as president elects. And we learned a lot through the daily sessions as you all have today. But more importantly, you learn from each other. So take advantage of that communication with each other. I'll tell you something. I don't know what possessed you to take on this job as president, <laughs> but since you've done it now, you put your neck in the news, you're going to do a fabulous job of whatever it is you're planning for your year because you've had fabulous training today. You know, we're sharing this opportunity to greet you, but we are here to support you. Yes, we're the current district governor group for Chesapeake Pets, but we have such great pride in the people that are following us and the people that went before us because they made us look better than we are, and we're going to make the people that follow us look better than we should let them look. <laughs> but we are here to help you. Please reach out to any one of us that we want to help you to be a resource and to be a sounding board. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. So, from what was our house last year to your house this year, imagine, imagine Rotary. Rotary. Thank you. Fellow Rotarians, um, it is my personal privilege to introduce John Smarge, our Rotary International Past Director. Early in his life, John Smarge demonstrated he was a person of action when he worked for a large interstate moving company in order to pay for his tuition while attending Farley Dickinson University. And at the age of 22, moved from the home st his home state of New Jersey to Naples, Florida, where he purchased a struggling moving company and since then has grown it to be the largest relocation business in the Southwest Florida. Since John joined the Rotary Club of Naples in 1982, he's provided leadership to this organization, serving as club president, district governor, member of the Rotary International Board of Directors and chairman of the executive committee in 2011-2012. As a Rotarian, he has continued to be a person of action 
by serving on numerous Rotary International Committees and is currently a member of the Shaping Rotary's Future Committee and the chair of the 2022 Rotary International Convention. John is a frequently sought after speaker throughout the world. John and his wife Cindy are strong supporters of our Rotary Foundation. John is also a person of action outside of the Rotary world. He is heavily involved in human, human, humanitarian efforts both in his community and other parts of the world. Let us all give a warm welcome to Ches Chesapeake Pets welcome to past Rotary International Director, John Smart. Thank you very much. Um, I, could, I couldn't be outdone. I heard from a little bird that he liked white rum. My bottle's not quite as big as it was at lunch, but John... <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Cliff, I want to thank you for that really kind introduction. I could just see my parents now if, if they were here. My mom would just be beaming with just, oh, glory. And my dad would be saying, who the hell is he talking about? I want to thank the Chesapeake Pets Committee for inviting me back. Um, I saw it's been 10 years since I first came here, and I truly appreciate your confidence in me to have me back. And I want to thank you also for providing me with, I don't call my aid, but to have me hang out with a good friend, Claude. Claude, thank you for all of your assistance this weekend. I got to tell you, I got a problem. No, I got a lot of problems. But there's one problem I think you can help me with. See, very often I'm asked to speak around the country on the topic of giving a speech. Now, who in this audience has heard me do that speech? Oh, man. <laughs> it's worse than I thought. So here's the circumstance. I teach a class on how to give a speech so all of you are not listening to me. You're simply checking boxes and say, John said not to do that. John said not to do that. So thank you. Please indulge me while I break all the rules that I tell you not to. I want to begin by reciting a, a quote. You've probably heard it before. It's probably one of the greatest quotes in my view in the 20th century. And it goes like this. It is not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out where the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust, sweat, and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually strives to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best in the end knows the triumph of high achievement, and who, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Now, when Theodore Roosevelt said those words in 1910 at the Sorbonne, he was, a rail, he was railing against the cynics who looked down upon those men and women who were trying to make the world a better place. Today, they would be us. They would be Rotarians. It was a call to action, a call to action to, for ex, ex, um, ordinary men and women to do extraordinary things. During the 1992-93 year, when I was president of the Rotary Club of Naples, I had that quote on my desk framed. And every morning when I got to work, I read it. It became my call to action 
to strive valiantly, to try to motivate my club to make the world a better place. I hope it's your call to action. It's interesting, I, um, Gordon talked about this at lunch, and I'm kind of repeating it, but it, it just, it seems like just yesterday for me. But it was, in fact, 30 years ago that I sat in a room like you at Pets for what would be probably the most incredible year of service that I've had in my lifetime, regardless of all the things I've been given a chance to do since then. I remember sitting in St. Hilary's Church in Fort Myers, Florida, a wide-eyed young president-elect thinking to myself, what the hell have I done? <laughs> what have I signed up for? But yet trying to desperately to soak in all of the rotary information that they were firing at me through that fire hose. There was a guy like me, some old past sister governor, who stood the lectern and provided what he thought was comforting advice. He said, don't worry. No matter how bad you are, you can't ruin your club in one year. Now, I will tell you, I chuckled too, but quietly, I was quite reassured. You see now, but after 30 years, knowing what I now know in Rotary, I'm sorry, I can't give you that same sage advice. <laughs> you see, that, that PDG had the philosophy that a president couldn't make that huge a negative impact on his or her club. So if you believe that you can't take a Rotary Club that's well run and in one year make it horrible, you also believe you can't take an average club or a below average club and make it incredible. I don't just believe it, I know it. I've seen it happen year after year by incredible presidents who come in and make changes. Now one of the first things that you need to do, I believe, as coming in, is you need to commit yourself to be open to change. Now, past legendary basketball coach John Wooden from UCLA, after he finished coaching, was on the corporate circuit giving speeches on leadership. I had the honor of, of hearing him one time, and he, he spoke about the 12 lessons of leadership. Lesson number 10 is, don't seek change. Seek significant change. Yeah. Now, let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And, and it's funny because I'm thinking about this. Half of this audience is not going to know what I'm talking about. In 1955, <laughs> in 1955, the Ford Motor Company was losing market share terribly to General Motors. The corporate executives knew they had to seek change. So in 1958, the answer to their prayers came rolling off the assembly line. The Ford Edsel. And I've asked a half a dozen people in the audience today who have hair that's brown, and they have no idea what Edsel is. I, I, Jeffrey, I gotta change that part of the speech, probably. <laughs> In the next three years, Ford Motor Company lost $350 million, which in today's dollars is $3 billion. They, they sought change and they made change, but was it the right change? A, a, a business periodical of the time concluded that the Etzel was a premium example of the corporate culture's failure to understand the needs and desires of the American consumer. So for you to be an effective Rotary Club president, you need to seek to understand the needs and desires of your customers, your members, 
and then make the significant changes necessary to answer their needs and desires. So let's talk about your members' needs. Now, unlike the rest of you who actually have a life, <laughs> I spend a lot of time reading surveys on membership and on branding and on and engagement. One of the surveys that I like the most, and those of you who have heard me talk about membership know of this survey, it's the Buffalo Survey. From the Rotary Club of Buffalo in New York, it's a big Rotary Club, about 350 members. They asked all of their members by a professional uh, firm why they stayed in the Rotary Club. The answers they received were very conclusive, yet they varied based on the length of time that they were members of the club, which coincided sort of to the age. Those who were in the club less traditionally were younger members. If you were a member from zero to five years, or under five years, the reason why they were members was because of self-serving reasons. Networking, business development, professional development, leadership skills, all those kind of things. It's interesting, and I'll say parenthetically here, as we've been talking a lot about our Rotary Clubs need to get younger members, right? I will submit to you that Younger people need Rotary as much as Rotary needs younger people. And here's the reason. These young folks who are coming out of colleges now, and I say young now, probably under 40, because I'm ancient, they, they have incredible hard skills. They're very analytical. They can look at a problem and decipher it and find a solution like me and others can't even think about doing. But they're losing the soft skills with this virtual environment that they live in with texting and Instagram and, and, and instant messaging. They're losing soft skills, the interpersonal relationships, the way to look at a person in the face and talk to them, the way to shake hand and engage. We provide that to them. That's our selling point to our younger people. All right, zero to five. If you're a member from five to 20 years, and traditionally you're a middle-aged person, what they want would community service. The things that we are traditionally known for, think it through. Middle age, they maybe have families. They want to make the community that they live in a better place to raise a family. So they want to do something in the community where better than Rotary, where you can do collectively what you can't do individually. And if you're a member over the 20 years, like me, some old guy, what you want is fellowship, a sensing of belonging, a place to go to where you feel comfortable. So here you are as president. You need to know that your customer, your members, have varied needs. You should be mindful that Rotary membership means different things to different people. Now, I remember, I remember quite vividly the first few weeks and month as president of the Rotary Club of Naples, a large, rather old, stuffy club. And it might surprise you that I was met with more than a little resistance. A member who at that point was about 30 years younger than the average member, who came in full of all excitement about Rotary. I thought we had a great club, but I thought we weren't a good Rotary club. So my goal was to make every member of my Rotary club participate in a community service activity or be part of a committee around a community service activity. And to help them, I gave them a chart. <laughs> my members love that chart. You'd walk in the door, and as you came in, there were three poster boards. On the left-hand side were the 150 names of my Rotary Club members. And next to each name was the blank that I would fill in when they did something. I hounded them from the microphone when they wouldn't sign up. You can imagine, about the second month of my presidency, my members had a real keen interest in the manual procedures. 
under the subsection impeaching a club president. <laughs> Let's analyze my club presidency knowing what we know about the survey, right? I was a nine-year member in my club, so I was in that five to 20-year category, which means Rotary to me was community service. My members, however, whose average age was a day older, th older than dirt, <laughs> Rotary to them was about fellowship. The harder I pushed my rotary, they pushed back their rotary. So I'll tell you, thankfully, we had a past president's council who took a keen interest. I guess it was like a pet project. So they got together with me at our, at our, our, our past president's council meeting. I remember sitting there in this old stuffy law firm, and the, the chairman of the council stood up and said, Boa. Are you trying to kill the club? I'm thinking, they told me at Pets, I can't kill the club. <laughs> Thankfully, they helped me through it, and they thwarted the impending coup. <laughs> but I learned a lesson that changed my philosophy about what my goals would be for my Rotary year. I hope it's something that you could adopt. I changed my philosophy to say that I will provide an opportunity for every member to experience Rotary in a way that is meaningful to them. And then I use all of the tools available in the Rotary toolbox to offer and satisfy those needs. Now, I will submit to you that the most important job the only reason why a Rotary Club actually exists, and maybe, Jeffrey, we can debate this later, but the reason why a Rotary Club exists is to answer the needs of its members. If you do that, everything takes care of itself. Right? If you're answering the needs of those members who want community service, it's going to happen. You've got to have the mindset of answering those needs. Does that sound easy to you? Yeah. It is not easy. And I would say, 95, I can't, I'll make up statistics. statistics. You know, I don't know how many percentage, but most Rotary Clubs don't do it. And if they did it around the world, we would not have a membership crisis like we have. Answer the needs of your customers and your members. Now, I've talked about, about philosophy enough. Let me talk about some nuts and bolts things, real life strategies for you to be a more effective club president. I will coin this part of my speech as those things that they didn't teach you in the, in the breakout sessions. <laughs> okay, so you want to do a club service project. Remember, one-on-one -on -one gets things done. Now, you can make an announcement from the lectern to educate your members about the project that you want to do. You can put it in a bulletin to give them more and more information, but you will not get participation unless you go to them face-to-face -face and ask them to help, right? So I go up, I say, Jim, in three weeks from now, we're doing a clean, clean the beach. Will you come? Of course he will, right? But there'll be sometimes people who will say and give objections. I remember a past president of my club said, John, I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm not comfortable asking people to do something. I'm thinking, now I'm, I own a company and I have a lot of salespeople, and I ask my salespeople every day, did you ask for the order? You see, they go into people's homes, and the people, the customers, are expecting them to ask. That's why they're there. Your club members expect to be asked to do something. That's why they're there. And I said, do not confuse objection with rejection. So we'll go again. Amelia, I'm having a, a, uh, a clean up the beach project in three weeks. Will you do it? Her answer is no. Here is, the, here is your thing. Amelia, I understand this isn't for you. What can we do to satisfy your needs? What do you want? What is Rotary to you? You use an objection for an opportunity to, to understand what your members need. Now, I will tell you just, again, parenthetically, if in my year as club president, if I had a beach cleanup on a hot day, 
I might lose half my members. So please, please be demographically correct when you do this. There are 52 weeks in a year. I would tell you each year, I would love if you would acknowledge a Rotarian of the Week each year, each week. If you have more than 50 members, have two. Find a way, if you have a head table, invite someone up to sit at the head table and then acknowledge who they are. They may have not done something for 30 years in the club, but find out about them and talk about them. Put them in the bulletin, do what you can do. You have an opportunity to make someone feel good about being members. Make someone feel as though they are appreciated. Do not pass up the opportunity during the course of your Rotary year to acknowledge every single member in the club for doing something. Do any of you have um, click tables? You know what a click table is, right? I'll give an example. I, I go into a Rotary Club. I'm not going to mention a name, name, Naples Pelican Bay. <laughs> and I go to sit down and I go, you can't sit here, Bob. That's Bob's seat. I, I don't see Bob. I'm here. Now, I have an issue with that, and I did it as a club president. And so you've all tried to fix that, right? So what you do is you, you tell them, please don't sit in the same tables. They still do. Even some people plow out those silly little numbers, right? And they just throw them away and ignore them. For me, what I did, I had um, control of the Beach Club Hotel where we had our meeting. And we sat tables of eight. So I asked the staff one week to set tables for seven. Oh, that was more entertainment than I could stand. People walking around aimlessly to go, where's my table? And then next week I set it for nine. I just keep rotating it. It was a ball. Now it's interesting because back then I didn't like the idea of click tables. But again, Buffalo Survey, remember that some members just want to come to Rotary to be around their fellow Rotarians. So I'm not as critical as I used to, but I do like for the older members to sit with younger members because it, that mentorship, that cross-pollination of ideas. Respect your elders. Do you have a past president's council in your club? Think about doing that. Think about having a past president's council. They're very valuable for you to get your own personal board of directors. I would meet with them, get ideas from them. I would listen to them because the past presidents, they're worse than past district governors. They want to keep talking. <laughs> I listen to them. Additionally, if I had an idea that I wanted to, to spawn in the club, I would get the past presidents on board. They would then go out to the club and sit at the tables and say ideas that they thought of. It's my idea. They thought of. And they would encourage other members so it was very easy for me to pass that new idea. Use the past president's council. Establish expectations. That's one of these hard ones, right? Folks say, wait a second, they're not employees. I can't expect anything from them. Yeah, you do. They're volunteers, but you have to expect something from them. So what I would do is I, I met with all of my avenues of service back then, all the different people who were doing things. I'm a breakfast guy, so I'd meet with my international service chair and say, what do you want to do during this Rotary year? He would lay out all his plans of what he was doing. I said, okay, I'm going to hold, hold you to them. Because now you've said what you want to do, and I'm going to have you do it. I'm going to expect it. I'm going to check with you on a quarterly basis to make sure it's being done. I met with the board of directors. Each one of them, I said, here are the expectations of a board of director. You must, you must go to district assembly, the conference. You must do this, 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 this. If you don't want to do it, tell me now. Because i got a line of people who want your job. Nobody wanted it. <laughs> Let's be honest. I, mean, I was begging this guy to do it, right? i got a line of people who want to do it. And I want to be friends with you in January. And if you tell me you're going to do this and you're not going to do it, we're going to have problems. As long as they understand the expectations up front, they should be accountable. Think of your job on July 1st as being the new CEO of a corporation. You've been asked by the board of directors to come in and make changes. Make the changes necessary. That's why they've hired you to be president. Be bold about what you're doing. 
And I promise you one more thing that I learned from personal experience. It does, in fact, take longer than 365 days to impeach a club president. <laughs> My fellow president-elects, I, 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 can't, I can't wait for July 1st and watch you come to that lectern for the first time and affect change in your club. Your Rotary Club will take on your personality. It will embody your culture based on how you feel about Rotary. What Rotary means in your heart, the compassion you have for your fellow mem members, and the passion you have for those less fortunate who we serve. For many of us, many of us, serving as a Rotary Club president will be a one-time honor. I ask you to strive valiantly. And at the year's end, when your face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, and figuratively it will be, rejoice in the triumph of high achievement, knowing that you and your Rotary Club, in fact, made this world a better place. I want to thank you for your kind attention. May God bless you and may God bless Rotary. Good evening. Isn't this a great escort to carry me up here? That was awesome. We want to thank you for such a wonderful presentation. This is for you from the CPETS Executive thank Committee, so and we are going to make a donation to the Rotary Foundation in your honor. Thank you very much. And we are very, very pleased. Thank you so much. I have to. So you're stuck with me for a couple more minutes. It is my honor and my privilege to stand up here and introduce our next speaker for us tonight. And her name is Diane Hegeman. Diane is on the CPETS Executive Board, and she has been our executive trainer for the last two years, and she is a personal friend and an amazing woman. She has an incredible Rotary history. She is with the Virginia Peninsula Club down in Newport News, Virginia, and was past district governor in 2016 and 2017. And she has, like I said, been the CPETS trainer, district trainer since 2020. She loves to play the piano. She loves hiking and fishing collecting old movie posters and memorabilia and needlework, and she loves me. So that <laughs> makes her great in my book. So, and everyone in this room too. So without any further ado, please welcome Diane, past district governor, Diane Hageman. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sheila. That was very wonderful and unexpected, and I appreciate that so much. You know, when we started this journey towards our planning for this year, we weren't sure we were going to be able to come back together, you know? But the stars and the planets all aligned up, and they lighted our way back here for some wonderful fellowship and of course training, and it's my pleasure tonight to recognize all of those who participated in training. Well, first I'd like to recognize the district trainers, and if I miss anyone or mispronounce the name, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to do it correctly. 
From 7,600, our district trainer was Jim Probsdorfer. From 7610, Walisha Gill. 7620, uh, Chris Zabriskie, I believe, yes. 7630, we, all, we had, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, I know, Pete Booker, right? And Aisha, <laughs> correct? Right. I also want to recognize someone who has been so loyal and faithful in its training, and that's Chuck Davidson. And he, of course, he um, has led our wonderful DGN, DGND roundtable year after year. I remember when I was coming up through the governor chain, I had the privilege of sitting in on it. And even today, when I sat in for a while, I learned something. So, Chuck, thank you for your continued leadership in that area. I also want to now recognize uh, one other person before. I have two more things to do. Um, I don't even know how to say thank you to Deb Jackson. Where is Deb? Stand up. Stand up, Deborah. You know, I didn't know Deborah very well until we started working together. And she guided and informed and gave great leadership as our facilitator coordinator this year. She accepted that position with grace and with enthusiasm and imparted that to all the facilitators under whose guidance um, they came. And it was just a, you know, thank you doesn't seem enough, but that's my heartfelt thank you to Deb for all of that. We found out that we are, we have so many things in common, it was scary, you know? So we have now become lifelong Rotarians, friends forever, Deb. So I thank you. Let's give her a round of applause, please. <laughs> and lastly, I don't want to forget all of those facilitators who graciously accepted the invitation. And I hope you all have had a good time in those multi-district breakout sessions that the facilitators have so ably led. I want every facilitator that participated to stand up, look at them, and give them a big round of applause. All the facilitators, please stand. Thank you all. A million, million thank yous, and we have some more great sessions tomorrow. I also want to thank our chairman, Jim Roney, for his leadership and for entrusting, and I don't, I don't even know the right word, just entrusting me with this, with this pleasurable job that I have as position of executive trainer. He had a lot of confidence in me, and I thank you very much for your support, Chairman Jim. Thank you very much. So as I end my two-year tenure, I just want to say a, a big thank you all over again to everyone who has been so supportive. So now I give you this charge. Let's go forth and continue to serve to change lives as we now imagine Rotary. Thank you all very much. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kathy Parsons. I am the venue chair for uh, the 22, 2022 um, Chesapeake Pets event. I have the opportunity uh, for the last four years to work very closely with the staff here at the Marriott that helps you to, uh, for all of our uh, hotel rooms, to all of our meeting spaces, to all of those uh, snacks and ice cream. <laughs> Who liked the ice cream today? <laughs> um, as well as all of our, our meals. And uh, I just, I have the opportunity uh, for the last year that I work very closely with the staff. Brad Morrison is a director of sales here, and I can't imagine what he must think of me sometimes with some of the calls I, I give him. Um, but when we're here, uh, you guys seen the red coat people? Uh, they're, they're incredible people. This hotel, I've never had them say no to me for anything. And uh, 
for my job, for what I do. Uh, this is an incredible place. Yes, it's not perfect, um, but we do hope that you've had a great time. And while you're out tomorrow, if you see any of the red coats, see any of the staff, just um, please say thank you. But one of the things that um, uh, John said tonight, you know, we celebrate. And we, we we're Tarians, we celebrate, we love, and we share. So it is my privilege, and as uh, in my industry, if anybody goes on cruises, um, the last night on the cruise, the uh, staff comes in, and we celebrate, and we say thank you. So tonight, if you get your um, napkins, I would like to introduce the Marriott wait staff that has been here, and let's all give a Rotarian thank you for your service. And uh, Randy, go ahead and hit the button. my personal thanks to the staff. They're just unbelievable. I've, uh, you may know Kathy is a member of my Rotary Club, and I've observed her. <laughs> that, yeah, that was a drop the mic moment. <laughs> Kathy's been venue chair four years with this, and I was executive trainer a couple years ago, so I, I saw her work, and I, I, I kind of knew the extent of, uh, of her dedication to Chesapeake Pets. This past year, I've had the pleasure of working with her you know, very closely as chair, and I had no idea of the amount of time and effort that has to be put in to creating an event like this. I, <laughs> Ka Kathy and I are gonna work again Next year for yours, Rudy, so don't worry, all right, dude? But I just want to thank you. I love you, and I have, I think a couple years ago they gave you flowers. This is a little better, maybe. <laughs> he knows me well. <laughs> Let's give her an applause, please. Hey, Mike Jello, where are you? All right. Well, just a few announcements before we get on with a very pleasurable evening. Uh, there is someone seated in this room who was separated from their folio, and I'm proud to announce that the Sergeant at Arms now have that in their custody. So if you're looking for your folio, find somebody in a red vest and we'll reunite you. The 50-50 raffle continues. Uh, after the photograph tonight, they'll be out there available. The drawing will be held at lunch tomorrow and it will be for a significant amount of money going to the In the Polio Now campaign and into the pocket of somebody. Tomorrow, the first event is at 8 o'clock, but I also want to call to your attention that there is a breakfast for those who get, care to get up a little earlier from 7 to 7.50 in the Fairfax room up on the second floor. So breakfast at 7, first Rotary event at 8. Now for tonight, when we leave this room, the Sergeant at Arms will be outside holding up the signs for the four districts that are here and if you would fall in underneath your sign for your district, we're going to take our mandatory photo that we take every year. And that'll take about 10 minutes. After which, down the hallway uh, toward uh, 
past the Monroe Room, we're going to have dessert with the district governor elects. And, and the uh, hotel staff has informed me they are going to turn on the heaters out on the patio. So if you're so inclined, you can have dessert outside as well. And with that, I bid you a nice evening. Jim, over to you.